This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. Awesome Chat is brought to you by Sidekick Media Services. We are your sidekick in business for social media, video production, and more. Find out more at sidekickmediaservices.com. And listeners like you, support this show at patreon.com slash awesomecast. <laughs> Live from the Sorgatron Media Studios in the Beachview neighborhood of Pittsburgh, PA, it is the awesome chat. Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here. Uh, this is the show where we talk with some awesome people in and around and sometimes outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, doing doing really awesome things all over the place. Uh, you can check out uh, previous interviews over at awesomecast.com. Uh, you can look up Awesome Chat on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music, or the video versions on the Facebook and YouTube pages for the Awesome Cast. And uh, you can keep an eye out on our Facebook page as well to see what events are coming up that you want to drop into uh, in, in the near future. Uh, hit us up on Awesome Cast on Twitter or awesomecast at sorgatronmedia.com if you have anybody that we would actually... Uh, you'd like us to talk to on the show or if you have any questions for anybody coming up uh, we'd love to hear them um, and of course support the show uh, patreon.com slash awesome cast uh, if you want to support that way or just share the show share the show with your friends and then these awesome conversations that are happening so uh, my guest this week is somebody I've known for a good long time she's been a, a regular you know I guess occurrence on <laughs> awesome cast for a while Cynthia Klosky joining us in the studio thank you for joining me Cindy Hi, how are you? Awesome. So, like I said, I've known you. Have, did I meet you in the first pod camp, second pod camp, something like that? Now we're going on to 12 this year? It's crazy. Yeah, I think it would have been the first one. I, I remember you being the um, crazy wrestling guys. A uh, <laughs> little bit um, scary at first sight, but it turned out that you were nice people. And so that was... Uh, Actually, you reflected very well on the wrestling world. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> the, the, the bright shining beacons of professional wrestling fan, fandom, I guess, right? That's right. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and, and the first time I met you, I, I remember um, you, along with uh, Mike Wojciech, were, were doing uh, Pittsburgh Bloggers, which was, was kind of a big thing at the time. That's right. So um, back in 2004, well, 2003, 2004, blogging was becoming a little bit more of a thing that a regular human could do. You didn't need to know so many uh, technical special skills. And so um, this was sort of the, the the glory days, I think, of the beginning of blogging. And there were different blogs popping up all around Pittsburgh, all around Pennsylvania, and there was no really good way to find them. So mm-hmm. we and a few other folks, Christina Schulman and, um, and Anne and Vanessa, we put together, um, we started out by putting together an event, the first blog fest, just to say, you know, we've been reading each other's stuff. Um, we have each other listed in our sidebars. Remember blog roles were a thing. You would have a list of blogs that you read on your blog. Um, and that was how people found out about each other. And so then we had this sort of little happy hour thing on the, um, on the North side. And Mike Wojcik showed up and said, Hey, you know what? I, I think we should make a website out of this without, well, great so so he did all the heavy lifting and um the rest of us just had the had the beer it was fun that's awesome and and, and that's that's really kind of you know i always you know we have a, a interesting circle of friends here in pittsburgh and and a friend of ours was all like how do you know all these people are they your family or something it's like no we're just twitter friends and we just became friends right and that was an interesting phenomenon i feel i had that happened in that era at least in our circles i guess well, the weird, this, the interesting thing about it, so I, I was at the time living up in Butler mm-hmm. and, and having lived in other larger cities, San Francisco, Boston, uh, on the D.C. area, I was feeling a little bit like alone up there. I mean, I had my, my family and friends up there as well, but I, um, I, f- I felt a little disconnected. But the way the web was evolving, you know, you could make friends. And I think that even if you lived in a city, you you don't always meet necessarily on your day to day basis folks who share your interests or or whatever. So so that's part of what the web, I think, and blogs and in the, before Twitter even did. And then as Twitter came around, you could have more conversational things. It mm-hmm. just kind of I don't know, kind of solidified a lot of those friendships or helped helped make them richer. We were talking about a little bit before we we went on to record here that I, I was like reading again over your bio over on uh, Shift Collaborative, who you're with now. We'll talk more about that here later. 
Um, but it always seemed like, like I'm reading all these things and knowing some of the stories you've told me before, it always seemed like you were kind of on the cutting edge uh, of things coming up here, like, like the blogging thing. Um, I want to get a little bit in your background. Uh, you know, what, what kind of attracted you to, uh, technical things that you're into now? Um, I think I've always been pretty geeky, Mm -hmm. you know, from being a young, young child, um, uh, in the early days when, you know, your, your, our entire high school had I think one computer and it was not in the school's office, <laughs> you know, that kind of a world. Um, so, you know, in, in high school, I was trying to learn how to program a little bit mm-hmm. early days of um, Apple II and things like that, I think. Uh, and then went to computer camp to learn how to program. I went to computer camp. That's the kind of person I was. You had a computer <laughs> camp? We had That's a computer amazing. Camp. <laughs> yeah. So where, it was. Where uh, I have Potts, signed up for computer camp. <laughs> Pottstown, Pennsylvania had oh, a had wow. a. So my my mother drove me out there. I spent the weekends. It was not really. I mean, it was you could stay overnight. It was in a it was in a boys' school, mm-hmm. the Hill School in um, Pottstown, and um, so you would go and we spent a week learning basic. Spent mm. a week learning Fortran. I forget all the things that Fortran. we did. Fortran. <laughs> Fortran. Yes. Um, so I was there for the, so that summer I, I was there um, t- taking the workshops. And then the next year they let me come back and be one of the assistants. Nice. Yeah. So um, I don't know. So, so I mean, I think I was a pretty geeky person all along. And then when I went to school, I I continued to do the sort of programming thing, but also mixed in writing because mm. I, I liked writing and nobody else at MIT w- really was into it. So then I felt very special, I suppose. So, um, so I think, for, so from a very early day, it just sort of, it's what I'm drawn to mm. no matter what it is. And and so as new technologies come along, I don't know that I'm really on the cutting cutting edge. I'm not inventing these things. No, no, no. But you you seem to be around. <laughs> it seems i'm drawn i'm like a moth to a, to yes. a technological flame exactly right. exactly i won't pause one second um you're right in the breath line give me some p sounds Go. popcorn peanuts that's good, that's good. All right. Um, and I'll just cut in my next question, which I haven't thought of yet because <laughs> I was thinking of that. Um, we were talking about summer camp. We're talking about technology. Okay. So, so you're, you're involved in all this stuff in, in, in this day, day and age. And, and, you know, the conversation, I mean, we have this on Awesome Cast a lot of times is, you know, women, women in STEM, you know, girls in STEM. Mm-hmm. um or you know girls writing or even you know things like that like what was kind of the scene like were you were, were you the only girl at, at, at a computer camp or anything like that almost yeah. almost yeah. yeah pretty much pretty much did you, did you find the one other girl and we're like okay we're sticking together or no no it wasn't <laughs> quite like i think i was the only girl who was who was boarding at the at the computer camp everybody mm-hmm. else was sort of a day student um, so I, I don't, I just, as I guess I've always done, I just make friends with whoever I make friends with. So I hung out with a bunch of guys for the summer. It was, that was fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very teenage girl, very shyly being as, uh, as, as, um, grown up as she can be, I suppose. Right. Uh, so uh, that's awesome. Uh, and you went from there and I know, uh, you went to MIT. I did. I went, I went and then I went back. You went they back. Let, they let me come back later as well. So <laughs> they let me leave, which was all I really wanted the first time. I mean, mm-hmm. when I say let me leave, it's just a hard school, mm-hmm. you know. And so you feel uh, you're proud to be there. And uh, maybe uh, maybe not everyone feels this way, but I was glad to be able to graduate. I was glad I got the got through ever, through it. You know, it really is. Um, as, particularly for undergrads, it just it beats you up. It really mm-hmm. does. But you learn, you know, you learn amazing things. You meet amazing people, and you know, you make friends that you keep for the rest of your life. Um, and you have the opportunity to do all kinds of interesting research and things if you take them up on that. So the thesis that you do, it can be something like I, I in my thesis, I uh, worked with a, a a group that was developing a kind of a multi simultaneous programming language and so but I was writing the documentation for it so I was learning and so my thesis was not only writing the manual for how to use their language Mm -hmm. but it was writing about writing the manual you know it was very meta that way 
and that is a it's like we're creating style guides or creating rules or talking about what's it like to interview a software engineer who doesn't really want to talk about his stuff you know so it was useful uh and it was and then it went that translated directly into the work that i did afterwards and this was kind of an emerging uh field in general at that time am i am i right well, I mean, I think that the writing of, uh, I mean, all these languages were, were being developed. It was emerging that the language that, you know, we were working in was Lisp uh, at the time, which is object oriented. Um, you know, shout out to all the Lisp folks that are that are listening. Um, so a lot of what we do now uses like the fundamentals that were that were in there, but the languages that we use now, of course, didn't exist then. So, mm -hmm. so I guess it was it was sort of evolving that way. Writing about these things in a way that, like the how you go about writing a, a useful manual or useful help guides or whatever, right? We were evolving like what's going to be what's going to work for people and what's not. How do we how do we write so it works for anybody? Um, so I guess it was sort of. Interesting. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, the, the 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 manual writing kind of that's what kind of took your your career further, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. from there, so I, I I worked for a startup in the Cambridge area doing real time expert systems. So that means like the programming where you were trying to get the knowledge out of an expert that would like for example um, run a, a water filtering plant or. Um, like a, I think Shell was one of our customers. How do you how do you run a petroleum plant? So all the little um, servos and things that open and close all the pipes. This was a was software that could operate that. Um, NASA was one of our clients. I got to go and teach a class at NASA Houston. Um, so I got then to get a tour of Mission Control where they where they did all the Apollo missions. I mean, it was the things that you got to run into as a as a kid just in your twenties. It was mm -hmm. so it was really wild. I mean, and that's kind of the interesting thing. I always say to people, like, you get out there and you make opportunities, right? And, and, and it sounds like that's exactly what you were doing. Well, I didn't, I mean, really, honestly, I wasn't even, I mean, I was just doing stuff and, and, and it, cool it, but things it pushed you forward in my way. These, yeah, 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 yeah. I felt lucky. And when you, when something good is happening, you try and take advantage of it, mm -hmm. sure. And you screw up all the time, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. Um, and of course, and, and I know like part of this, you know, one that kind of surprised me is, is came up on Awesome Cast one time. You worked at Next Computer, which, you know, if you, those who don't know, that was Steve Jobs' company, um, I guess, in between Apple runs. Right, right. He had been kicked out of Apple mm -hmm. by someone who came in. I can't remember the dude's name from Disney, I think, or something. It was, a, it was the Pepsi guy. Oh, Pepsi, yeah. yeah, 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 Pepsi, right. I, you just watch the movie, you'll get the updates. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but so he had, um, they had started Next Computer in the 80s while I was still in school, and they had, you know, creating this really interesting company. So I had been following it um, along with friends, and I was um, a member of the Bay Area Next Users Group, Bang. So, you know, we had users <laughs> groups at the time, um, and I was the editor of their... Um, of a newsletter that we did is this next user. I mean, it's like trying mm -hmm. to promote the use of the computers and, and just be kind of, you know, fan boys and fan girls for Steve Jobs as well. So, so I was, you know, I was very drawn to it and they had an opening for a writer and I went and interviewed and the process at the time I was working at Oracle. So Oracle, huge 5,000 while I was there, it went from 5,000 people to 7,000 people in about two years. And um, it was a crazy place. And in the sense of that you were doing amazing things, you were, we were making um, boatloads of money, and I was really, really unhappy. No offense to Oracle, but I, I was really unhappy. <laughs> it just wasn't, I wasn't having fun. It just wasn't a good environment for you. It just, yeah, for, for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned an awful lot about databases, which also was good, you know. And, um, but I wanted to work at Next because it was going to be cool. Steve Jobs, you know, we're going to change the world. We're going to really remake computing and manufacture uh, and software and everything. So I interviewed for this tech writing job and the interview process was so awful. I said, no, thank you. Like I said, before they would make a decision, I said, I'm sorry, but the way this is going, I just feel like I wouldn't really fit in with this group. You know, they were, they were just, they were doing the kind of interviews that you've heard like horror stories about for like a big, like a Microsoft or a Google at different years. They're, they've, and Google in particular has like really changed the way they do this, but um, it just, you know, they were mean, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And why, why would you, why would you, anyway, so I said, no, thank you. But then I, about a year later, they had another opportunity come up where it was a different role. It wasn't, 
who was a writer but being an editor for their support, uh, customer support stuff. So I went back. They were nicer. <laughs> and, um, and so then I did sign on. Mm. And that was right after they laid off all of the hardware. So they mm. were going to, because the hardware was losing money, they were going to just focus on the software. And that software then was going to run on Windows computers. I mean, so uh, on any old computer. So mm. it was a really radical change. I mean, and many people kind of viewed it as like a betrayal of like the, the vision. It sounds like what happened eventually with Mac OS mm -hmm. where they went to Intel mm -hmm. a little bit, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a similar sort of thing. Well, so the operating system that they were doing from the, the next operating system, as I understand it, is the fundamental operating mm -hmm. system now for for all of those things. So for, for OS X, for Mac, now Mac OS, and I believe probably in some aspect for our iPhones and iPads too. Right. Mm -hmm. So 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 that's what so what I my role there was first to come in and write again sort of guides for system administrators and mm -hmm. uh, end users, so two different audiences there about how to manage and use their next software. And for uh, just to kind of so people know kind of where next computers were like this wasn't like a consumer thing that a lot of us would have been able to get. They were really kind of targeting that high end corporate this kind of problem. thing, right? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. It was that they couldn't really figure out what their market was. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the beginning, it was supposed to be there was a point where it was higher ed. But it was so expensive that no one in higher ed could afford this thing. Mm -hmm. Then they're pitching um, because the um, the graphics were so amazing. They were pitching it to designers and illustrators and things. But again, the price point it was really hard when you compared it with what you. This is why the hardware was crazy. Because mm -hmm. I mean, it was like titanium cases. I mean, the stuff was just nuts. Um, that when you or magnesium, whatever it is, you, like you could light it on fire and it would. It would burn blue. <laughs> it was crazy stuff. So, and and that was a feature, <laughs> not really. But you know, they were they were beautiful. They were very steep. Mm. They were very beautiful. Mm. But um, it was not sensible when you compared it with how you could buy like you know these um, Intel computers for like nothing, and like mm -hmm. you could have you could just put the components together. You could buy pieces of them and assemble them in your basement. Were these the like like Pixar probably had a few of these, right? So I'm Steve not... also had was yeah. a, a owner of Pixar. Yeah. And so Pixar did a lot of their yeah early work, I guess. On just, just like later when he became part of like your, like Pixar is like look what we're doing with these Mac Pros and you know not to mention they have like 50 of them to do a render farm or, right. what, or whatever it takes or something like that right. while we're like our little video shop saying we're trying to make one video <laughs> i want to render for 10 frames <laughs> yes exactly that doesn't take an hour please um but, but anyway it's a side point right. but um so 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 you you know and you you've actually had met steve jobs i through met that steve process, i did so. i you know not as many you know when i say i worked there i mean we had a i guess um maybe 150 to 200 people were mm -hmm. working at the company when I was there, which is a small enough group that you can kind of get to know people, certainly recognize them. And you would see Steve around. I was terrified of him, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I mean, you just from, you by reputation. Oh yeah. The stories at that point. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but he also, like I say, he was busy doing marketing and selling the company, selling the, the vision, but also doing things with Pixar. And so he would go and spend time over at Pixar too. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I, I mean, I remember like my first team meeting with all the writing team, um, he came in to talk to our, our manager. And, um, so she introduced me, she said this, the, Cynthia, the new person, and I shook his hand and uh, I, I've told this story so many times, but he had really, really soft hands, at least at that point, just, they were just, it felt very strange because she thought of him as sort of like this, I don't know, bigger than life statue or something. And they were mm -hmm. like, like the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> <laughs> but firm, but firm. Okay. Um, and I ran into him maybe a couple more times, complimented him on his eyeglasses one time, and he laughed because I like blurted it out. I don't know. So you would see him around the building. Um, but I did see there were times when, I remember one time he was rehearsing something for, you know, like on Monday we had this great big, they had the great big Apple reveal of the new their new stuff. Well, we did that with Next stuff mm -hmm. too. And he was rehearsing for one of those things. And so he was doing a trial run in front of the whole company and a piece of technology did not work. And so in front of the whole company, he just tore he tore the head off of the of the poor guy that had been like responsible for putting that piece together. Like there was no reason to go insane in front of all of us. You right, know? right. So it was things like that that really that really did sour me a bit on some of what was going on. 
Um, but I also thought that as, you know, in the software world, from what I'd seen from all the companies I'd been in at that time, that there were, had to be better ways to manage people, you know, because people who were managers at that point, if you made your way up through the company, you started as a tech guy, usually guy, and you weren't necessarily a managing person or you didn't necessarily have an affinity for cultivating talent or anything like that. And I thought, well, other industries have figured this out. So we should learn from other industries. So I said, I'm going to go to business school. I'm going to learn. I'm going to bring it back to the software world. And I remember talking to the VP of software engineering at Next and say, telling him this is what I was doing. I'd already been accepted to a grad program. And said, so when I, when I get out, would you, would you hire me back? Mm -hmm. He said, no. Because I, be, I still wouldn't be a programmer in his eyes. Mm -hmm. So. Wow. I know. Which then, you know, they want somebody with a background that knows what they're talking about, right? But then they're not business people. Well, do you, how much do you really need to be able to, to do programming, uh, you know, to, at, a, at a detail level to be able to manage people? They're different right. skill sets. Oh, absolutely. So you have different to have an awareness per, of how it goes. Right. Right. So, so yeah. So, um, so I, I think that in the end, I think companies now increasingly are understanding that, but clearly you also hear stories, you know, from everywhere that not everything has been quite absorbed yet. So, no, so no. that there's still room to grow. Yes. Um, so from that, is that what kind of turned you into the, the like, uh, cause I know you originally as, as being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. uh, as well, uh, big, big design, I think at the time and everything like that, how did you come across? I need, I'm just going to do this myself or it was it kind of oh, well, the spark from business yeah. school or no, no, no. I think before then, uh, and this is why maybe a place like Oracle was hard when you're, you're just feeling like you're a cog mm -hmm. in a, in a very large, large machine, a massive machine. Um, whereas a smaller company, you can feel a little bit more engaged with the bottom line. But growing up, my parents had their own company, um, Commonwealth Utility Equipment Company, which assembled the um, cherry picker type trucks, the hmm. trucks that fix telephone poles, so, you know, bucket trucks. So, so that entrepreneurial spirit, like I could, I would see my dad and my mom both involved in this company on a day-to-day -day basis, doing all of the management things, worrying about the company for them, you know, but also being in control of, of their work. And so I just always saw that as kind of, oh, that's how, that's how people spend their days, you know? So I, I think I just absorbed it really then. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and, and, and of course through that you were doing like web design, things like that. Right. And it kind of, yeah. So when I moved back to Pennsylvania, I was working with my parents, but on the side, I started to build websites. This mm -hmm. was 99 and I liked, um, the, you know, the geekiness of it again, the programming side. Um, but then I started to build them for other people. And I, what I like about this kind of work, this is just the beginning of my, I guess, my agency life, if you will, is that you're learning a new, your client's business or situation or whatever it is, and then helping them translate what they are saying to words that their audience will understand, which isn't always the same as what the person is saying the first time. And then also doing the design and the programming and the other things that, that make that be workable on the web. So... So yeah, so it was a really great fit for all these different areas that I experienced and 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 worked in, um, kind of bringing that all together. That's awesome. Um, and, and currently now you're with Shift Collaborative, and again part of a kind of a, another agency. Yeah. So so we merged Big Big Design with Shift in 2015, and so where before it was more of you know mostly me doing the freelancing thing, almost under a company name. Uh, here I get to be part of a team and if my client needs things that are design or PR or advertising I've got people who specialize in those things but all of us are really multifunctional too so we have mm -hmm. a great great team working together and the collaboration part is the to me the real asset so it's, it's all of that kind of problem solving for clients but also problem solving with the client, with their P team, with our team, like all these people working together. I really thrive on that. Is this, um, you know, it, 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 do you find that like, like Pittsburgh really kind of helps that kind of spirit in, in, in like, there's, there seems to be a lot of interesting tech things going on in this area and entrepreneurs and, you know, these small agencies like this in this area. There's a lot. Yeah. I mean that we were, we, we remark on that all the time that there's another agency that we didn't know about, but there's a lot mm -hmm. of work too. So it's not very cutthroat. Um, so I do think it is more supportive, like you're saying, that there's more 
it's a small place. So, you know, you'll run into these people again. And I see people leave one firm, join another, leave that firm, go to another place, you know, so you can't be mean. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. going to come back at you later. Um, but also, why would you want to? There's just there's enough work and things to go around. Absolutely. And I know you're, you guys are out in East Liberty, which is definitely an area that has seeing a lot of that happen uh, as well. I know you were trying to get me to come out there a little bit ago. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's a fun place to, to be, a fun, good place to work. I like the um, energy of the neighborhood and different kinds of people you get to interact with every day. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, we're, we're, you know, you think, well, we're right by Google. I don't know how much I see the, the Googlers. I don't know if they ever like leave their building really <laughs> very often. My, my friends yeah, who work the, there seem the, like they really stay there. The Google shut-ins. I mean, hey, when you got like free food and I, I don't they have like a ball pit or something, I, I, you know. Oh, they've got all <laughs> kinds of goodies in there. But so I don't, but, but other, there's a lot of, there is a lot of energy in the whole area. Mm. So that's, so that's fun. And I think that's part of why there's so many co-working spaces now too. Um, because people want some flexibility um, to have their job be the way they want it to be, but you can't like always be sitting in your in your home office. Mm-hmm. It gets a little lonely. Awesome. Um, so I, I guess you know, kind of the, to wrap this up. You know, do you have any advice for um, you know, like I say, we talk a lot about STEM and women. You know, uh, in this, do you have any advice for for any girls that want to get into this kind of work? The advice I would give, whether no matter what it is that you want, I think it's to be willing to ask for help and don't be worried that you look stupid. I think I, sp- I wasted a lot of time in my life. And even now I still do. I like, I want to, I want to already know how it works without having learned it sometimes, mm-hmm. or I don't want people to know that I don't know, but everyone's happy to help, you know, and they don't look down on you for trying. We all started somewhere. So that like, getting over the fear of appearing wrong or foolish or whatever it is. If, if there's, the more that you can do that, the better. It's almost an impossible task because we all feel like imposters at different, like throughout our lives. But, um, but just knowing that the rest of us are here to like help you up too. That's awesome. Uh, where can people find you online? And are there any kind of recent projects that have come out that you've had a hand in that uh, people, people can check out? All kinds of good stuff that we're that we're um, working on. Uh, you can find Shift online at shiftcollaborative.com, and and I'm on Twitter as Cynthia Klosky. You can find Shift at Shift USA on Twitter, and of course we're on Facebook and all those places. And you get to one of them, that you'll probably get to all the others. I'm pretty Googleable. Um, things that well, something we've got coming up next week. Um, you know, we're Google partners. We do a lot of work with um, the online ads you know, all kinds of good things there. And we've got actually a, um, a session where Google um, experts will be uh, talking to via video to us at a lunch. And so we're inviting clients and prospects or anybody that's just as interested, particularly if you're focused on business to business, because you kind of think sometimes how exactly should I be using all these tools mm-hmm. to, to tell a business message? It's easy to think of it for a consumer message. So, um, so that's a free thing. If you're interested in that, drop me a note and I'll get you hooked up. That's awesome. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, Cynthia Klosky. Um, and when you'll be joining us, I believe next week on the awesome, or okay, depending on when you've heard this, she may have recently been on the awesome cast. <laughs> so, but always, uh, uh, thankfully contributing that and bringing her expertise to that show as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And if you uh, enjoyed this and, and other one, check out other discussions that we've had again, awesome chat, uh, wherever you like to get your podcast from, or check out the entire catalog over at awesomecast.com and check out all the other shows, including the main awesome cast. We have that every Tuesday night live on Facebook and a lot of other places these days at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time every Tuesday. Uh, you can get the live uh, live.awesomecast.net has a short link to wherever we would like you to stream that. And we have a lot of great chat room that uh, joins us there as well. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for my awesome guest. You've been our awesome audience. Have an awesome week. <laughs> This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.